of First Kings chapter 17, and shall we stand to honor the reading of God's Word? First uh, Kings 17, and don't hold it against me because my Rhode Island accent is coming out pretty bad today for some reason. I just noticed it just even now, you know, so... I feel like I'm back in Rhode Island where, where I don't want to go back to. So, uh, <laughs> physically or uh, language wise, either. So. <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians, 1 uh, Kings. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17, and in verse 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress, mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Dear Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you help me as I preach, that I help point and encourage uh, those here to look to you, whether it's in good times or trying times, and may you reshape our thinking, Lord. May your spirit have liberty. Meet with us in a special way, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So just as a recap, last week um, we saw that Elijah was sent to a widow woman in, to, in Zidon, which was actually the home or the country, home country of Jezebel, the queen of, of Israel, who wants very much to get Elijah. And... He goes there and requests bread and requests water. Well, she only had a handful of meal and a cruise of oil. And because she believed, uh, had faith in, in God at, for that point, the Lord provided for her through the entire famine or drought. And we have now another situation that happens when Elijah is there at the widow's house. And it doesn't really tell us, you know, how long he was there before this event happens where her son dies. And in the midst of this tragedy, in the midst of this sorrow and hardship of her losing her son or her son dying, the Lord was still able to reshape her thinking on some things. And when you think about what God is looking to do in our lives is to reshape our thinking. Sometimes it takes us going through some difficult times for that to happen. Amen. But it, it it, it goes to the point when, when you look at this passage of Scripture that it highlights 
the carnal thinking. And it also reflects the spiritual thinking that, that takes place. And so, let's ask this question. Has God reshaped my thinking? Has God reshaped my thoughts? And as we go through here, we see first that she started off with carnal thinking. And as very well, as, as believers, we could have carnal thinking. And I'm going to go through a few things here. What exactly does it mean? Uh, and so, first, in verses 17 and 18, we see that this understanding or, or worldly or carnal thinking blames others for the consequence of our sins. Look in verse 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? When we're thinking carnally, that's what we do. We, we blame others for the consequences of our sin. Now, was her son dying the consequence of her sin? Who knows? But one thing was for sure, she accused Elijah for the guilt that she was having. Right? Have you come to bring this up before me? And I can say that deflection away from taking responsibility for our own actions never, ever, ever alleviates our guilt. Amen. People feeling guilty, they deflect. Or they blame others thinking that somehow uh, that will help them, but it never does. And changing the definition of it also, to satisfy our flesh, never alleviates our guilt. So her, her son dies and her response is to blame Elijah for calling up her sin to remembrance. And that's what carnal thinking does. Right? We never want to take responsibility for our own actions or our own sin. And we have, somehow want to blame others, but it doesn't work. It never alleviates the guilt because the fact is, it's still there. Amen. So carnal thinking really blames others for our sins and the consequences for our sins. Also carnal thinking doesn't understand the remedy either. Let's look in verse 19. We see her, her thinking in this, of course, blaming Elijah, but we get to 19. She doesn't understand the remedy for the problem. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up in a loft where he abode and laid upon him his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, uh, let's actually, let me jump down to verse 22. So 19 and then 22 instead of reading all the way through, just so I can highlight here. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. So the remedy in this particular situation was calling upon the Lord. Amen. Who did she call upon to try to get uh, alleviation from this situation. She called on to the wrong person, Elijah. And you say, well, yeah, but Elijah prayed on to the Lord. She should have went to the Lord. Amen. And so, didn't understand the remedy. Obviously, Elijah understood the remedy. The remedy was not, not sitting there complaining about it or, or being sorrowful about it, but bring it to the Lord. And when we understand the remedy, the remedy was, was really a, a quickening, a, a making alive. The remedy to the situation was bring it to the Lord so he can come back to life. Now, obviously, uh, who has been known to come back to life at that point? Right? So, and, and I understand that, but Elijah knew the remedy. Go to the Lord. She didn't understand the remedy. And a lot of times our carnal thinking doesn't, doesn't understand the remedy. She thought the remedy was to complain. 
deflect or even accuse Elijah in this situation, but did not understand that it was God who provided the meal that never wasted, who provided the oil that never ran dry. That same God who provided that is the same God the go-to for the remedy of this situation. Amen. And so many times uh, in our sin or in our carnality, we don't understand what the remedy is. Uh, keep your place there. Turn over to Romans chapter 2. The remedy when God brings conviction is not to accuse, not to complain. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it back to the, the sin aspect because evidently she had unaddressed issues in regards to her own sin. So we see Romans chapter 2 verse 15, it says this about the law of God, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So just so you understand the context, the Apostle Paul's writing here to prove that we're all guilty. We, we've all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And part of his, his argument as he's building up here, he says, you have the Jews that have the word of God, the law, that they can read and they still disobey. They're still sinners. Then you have the Gentiles who didn't have the opportunity to have the word of God. But what they have, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness. So, even though you don't have a copy of the Word of God to read, God has still written His law upon the hearts. The problem is, sin gets in the way. And how does sin get in the way? Well, he, he says it right here. And their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So when we violate God's law that's written in our hearts, and there's guilt as a result, the guilt isn't people uh, telling you that it's right and wrong. The guilt is built in. It's God telling you it's right or wrong. And so as a result, that guilt, what is the natural response? Accuse. Well, it's your fault. Elijah, it's your fault you're bringing this to my remembrance. You're bringing this in. And that's what people do. They feel guilt. And what do they do? They accuse others. Instead of dealing with it. And it says, or else excusing one another. What that is? They do it. Right? You remember that old adage? Maybe some of you... Uh, or uh, remember, or maybe you use this as well, right? Uh, you, you get in trouble from your, with your parents growing up. And they said, why'd you do that? Well, you would say, my friend did it. Well, if they would jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? <laughs> oh. Depends how high, and if it was over water, yeah, yeah you know. Uh, I was a boy, right? So, uh, uh, what do we do? We excuse one another. It's somehow all right because other people do it. And we don't understand the remedy to get rid of that guilt. It's not accusing. It's not excusing. The remedy for that is to go to God Amen. and humble ourselves before God. But carnal thinking doesn't work that way, right? We, we, we have difficulty. Also, carnal thinking is at odds with, with God. Yes. See, her thinking was not on the same wavelength as Elijah's, but it was definitely not on the same wavelength as the Lord's. And neither is ours when our minds are on earthly solutions to our spiritual problems. 
And so look over in Romans chapter 8. Even addresses this. Romans chapter 8 is a wonderful, uh, wonderful chapter Amen. about victory through the Spirit of God as a believer against the flesh, which is addressed in chapter 7 about this conflict that we have with the flesh. And the solution is through the Spirit. Because we're no longer under condemnation for those who go to Christ for the solution and find forgiveness and redemption, there's no more condemnation. And that is so wonderful because it doesn't matter how guilty I am, the solution is Jesus Christ paid it all. Amen. And that's the solution. Amen. He paid it all. But it requires me recognizing that it's wrong. Uh, but let's look in verse 7 of chapter 8. He says this about our carnal mind. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So... Our minds, when it's on earthly things or worldly things, or as it says here, carnal things, uh, we're not walking in the Spirit. That mind is enmity with God. It means it's always conflicting with God. It's fighting against God. There, there's, there's, there's no peace there with God. And that's what happens, right? Our carnal thinking is at odds with God. Who has provided the solution? So easy. And the solution so easy. The solution, well, shall I say, the solution so simple. Not so easy, right? There's a big difference, right? So, uh, very simple. Not so easy because we like to hold on to our carnality, our flesh. So carnal thinking, though, look at this. In verse 6 of Romans, chapter 8. For to be carnally minded is what? Death. Death. This woman's son lay there dead. So you understand... Her husband had already died. How do I know that? She's a widow. She's a widow. There you go, right? <laughs> She's a widow. So she lost her husband. Now she has lost her son. And so we, we go back to 1 Kings chapter 17. It says this, verse 18. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee? O thou man of God, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? So, we're not sure what her sin was. But, she somehow connected her sin to that of her son's death. And so, most likely, the sin was, she had this boy born out of wedlock. Because, you know, the superstition, there, and it, sometimes you hear it with Christians, oh, uh, that happened because, you know, I even heard, I've even heard, people say, oh, God took my child because, you know, I wasn't thankful. I'm like, what makes you think that? But obviously she had a sin that she was connecting to the death of her son and possibly was she had this boy out of wedlock before she was married. We don't know fully, but usually that's what people make the connections with, right? This happened because of something I did. Uh, and But understand this, every solution that you can come up with that leaves God out of it to be carnally minded is death. It's a dead solution. Every thought or manifestation that you can come up with that leaves God out of it is death. And you may even seem to prosper in it for a while. But the end is 
death if it's not focus on God and does not come from God. Uh, it's like Proverbs 14.12, and you can turn there if you, you wish. Proverbs 14.12. Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Whatever that situation is, if it seems right to you, but it's not based upon God and His Spirit, it is death. It is death. And so, those are the results of carnal thinking. But, but here's, here's godly thinking and, and what it does. Uh, let's look back in 1 Kings 17. In verse 19, understand this, that godly thinking is sanctified. Thinking. So let's look verse, in verse 19. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft. What did he do? He separated him from her. And he's like, why did he do that? Take her apart. He didn't just take her, put him there. He, he took him apart. Because he needed to get set apart so he could cry out to God. He needed to get uh, sanctified, and sanctified means set apart. He, need to, he needed to set himself apart to focus on God for this situation. And you notice, did Elijah argue with her? No. Uh, did Elijah seek to justify anything? No. What he did was, he set himself apart to cry unto God. And that was the real solution, right? Our, our, our godly thinking is sanctified. We, 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 we bring it to God. And you know, God is working on us, even now, to be sanctified, set apart for Him, and to have our thoughts that when something arises, we set ourselves apart to go to Him. There's one day we, we, we will be fully sanctified. And, and so you understand there's a process. We are sanctified positionally. When we're saved, we've been set apart from God. We're sanctified practically in the sense that God wants to work on us and, and, and work on our bodies and, and our actions to separate us, to sanctify us here. And then there will be an ultimate sanctification when we see Him face to face. And, and part of what what describes this whole process is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22, 23. Some people are turning, so I'll wait just a little bit here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. The, the doctrine of sanctification is so important in understanding our walk with Him. Yes, He sanctifies us when we're saved. And He's sanctifying us. And then we will be fully sanctified. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he wants to sanctify us wholly. Why? Because our spirit sanctified when we get saved. So our spirit which was dead is made alive, it's sanctified, and it's that spirit in us that communicates with the Holy Spirit. But what's the matter is our bodies aren't very sanctified. <laughs> Because we still understand sin. We still know sin. We still have our flesh that, that, that is so weak. 
And God's looking to sanctify us wholly so that when we're with him, obviously we'll be completely sanctified. So godly thinking is really a sanctified thinking. I'm going to set myself apart. It's different. It's free from the pollution and the corruption. And so to, to focus on God, he had to withdraw himself from that situation, which was take the boy, I'm going up to the loft. Godly thinking is also directed Godward. Not trying to scheme or think of some earthly means, but to go to God. Here again, over in 1 Kings 17, uh, we have verse 20. We know he takes, he takes them apart, separates them from that situation. And in, in verse 20 it says, And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? So when it needed to be addressed, did he say, I need to consult with another prophet here. When it needed to be addressed, did, did he cry on to the mother? No. When it needed to be addressed, did he say, you know what, I think we need to go get another neighbor involved in this whole situation. And you say, well, that's kind of ridiculous. That, yes, true. Why do we do that then? There's a problem. Instead of going to God, who do we go to? We complain to our neighbor. We complain to our friend. That doesn't help. Because the godly thinking isn't complaining on to someone else. It's, it's going on to God. And he cried on to God. I'm reminded of Psalm 94, 19. It says, In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. So when God is in the multitude of our thoughts... You know where we get our comfort from? Him. So godly thinking is directed Godward in the face of our problems. Godly thinking is also transform thinking. And I'm going to get to it in her life in a second here. But turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We have a couple of New Testament verses that illustrate this point perfectly. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have to take our vain thoughts. Bring them to God. We need to take our greedy thoughts. Bring them to God. We need to take our pitiful thoughts. Bring them to God. And allow God to transform them into godly thinking. There are so many quasi-Christian self-help gurus out there that seek to have you fulfill your dreams by manifesting it, your thoughts in, in certain ways. And they, they talk about dreaming in, in these, in, in, uh, for, for these goals and these achievements. And if you do that, God will manifest it to you. And, and this, all this nonsense. And it's all wrapped up in greed and vanity. And the sad thing is they take scriptures and twist it. One of, the, one of the big things, and they even have books, as a man thinketh in his heart. Yeah, uh, that's great. And, and, and to some aspects, I, I agree with that. Well, no. I agree with that verse wholeheartedly. But, in, but not in the aspects that they bring it out. Because when you actually look around the surrounding, it's talking about people who are evil. And because they're thinking evil thoughts, they are evil people. 
It's not talking there. I'm thinking on a million dollars and I'm going to get it. Well, maybe that's the evil person thinking on a million dollars and going to get it. So, But they're trying to spin it in a way that it's, it's not applicable. And yes, the, the idea is not the power of positive thinking. And I don't care if it was a reverend who wrote that. Reverend... I, I, I very much dislike the word reverend anyways, you know, but, uh, but Norman Vincent Peale uh, wrote it, and then the guy that kind of, his disciple um, Robert, Robert Schuller uh, took after it, and it kind of blossomed out from there. And, and the, the power of positive thinking, the problem is, where is God? You can be positive in your thinking and be dead wrong. Amen. And so it's not the power of positive thinking. What I like to say is the Bible and, and declares the power of godly thinking. And the transformed mind will seek God's answers first. Yes. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with goals, and we need to have goals. But what I'm saying is this whole idea of manifestation in our thoughts and God wants us to have these big dreams and live in yachts and mansions and all this stuff, right? That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Over in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and, you know, this is Philippians 4, verse 8. Uh, I could possibly be on that, that, that verse for 10 weeks, but when I get there, I won't do that to you, so... At least I don't think I will. So <laughs> I better be careful what I say. I do not think I'll be. Uh, I'll preach that verse for ten weeks, but you know, never know. But anyways, uh, Philippians four verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, you know what the kind of thoughts that God wants us to have is not greedy thoughts, not blaming thoughts, not carnal thoughts, but holy thoughts, pure thoughts, not even positive thoughts but godly thoughts. And that's where the power's in, in it to transform your life. To really transform your thinking from carnal thinking to godly thinking. And so, so important. And how does that apply? Well, look at how Elijah's godly response actually makes an impact on her. And reshapes her thinking. So turn back to 1 Kings 17. And the Lord heard the voice... Uh, verse 22, I'm sorry. Uh, 17, uh, 17, 22. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came in to him again. And he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. So Elijah's response, what did he do? He went to the Lord. No other. Uh, and the Lord provided the answer. Not only did he provide the answer, he provided the solution as well. And that's how great our God is. He has the answer, provides the solution. And as a result, this woman's thinking was transformed by the prophet's response. Because she says this in verse 24. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know, I know, that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. You mean she didn't understand that from the, the meal not uh, wasting and the, the cruise of oil not going dry? She didn't understand that? that yeah, sometimes, 
Sometimes it takes several things, even for us, to understand uh, and to know. So it was, it was because it was towards the Lord and his response was towards the Lord. The woman's thinking was transformed now towards, it said, the word of the Lord is in thy mouth. The remedy of her guilt wasn't blaming God or the preacher like she initially did. The remedy wasn't really in her son being brought back to life. Because what if that never happened? It may have been the impetus, though, to get her to the next step in her faith journey. The remedy is always having a change of mind, which is known as repentance, in the midst of our sin and our guilt. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance. You know why we have this guilt response? is not for us to stay in that guilt. That's where a lot of people, uh, you know, they crumble under the weight. Even if you deny the guilt, you still feel it. But as believers, when we come to Christ, and, and we understand this truly, that when we come to Christ for salvation... That it brings life. And so that guilt that we've had because of our sin nature, not only can we find forgiveness, but we find the alleviation of the guilt that goes behind it. And so for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. That means you change your mind to go to Christ for the remedy, don't change your mind again. <laughs> don't go back to the world. He said, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So getting angry about the lack of remedy doesn't do any good. Blaming the preacher, Elijah in this case, for the consequence doesn't do any good. Denying that you have a problem doesn't do any good either justifying that your sin is really not the problem doesn't do any good. But when we realize that this guilt, godly sorrow, is something that requires repentance, a change of mind, you agree with God on the the, the sinness, the sin or the, the wrongness of it, and it's subsequent forgiveness that starts us down the road of a transformed mind that realizes the answer to any question, any problem, or any situation is to go to God. Amen. And so this, this woman, who even having this, the meal provide for her, no longer starving, no longer ready to die, you know, just preparing her last meal to die, had this meal prepared for her, he says, she didn't know it before, but this situation, seeing Elijah go to God for the solution, it says, and the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Remember, she's saying that the, the word of the Lord, she knew the Lord was speaking through him anyways, but now she's saying the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Do we, do we believe that God's word is truth? Amen. And if we do, he'll be the one we go to. And the transformed thinking is to get our carnal minds to think spiritually and to think on God and realize that He is the solution. He is the answer to any situation or problem. And say, now I know that the word of the Lord is true. Amen. Dear Father, I pray that you help